and thanks for joining us as we take you around San Diego. I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. I'll get you caught up on a week's worth of news and look ahead in just 30 minutes. We do begin with our beloved Padres. A new piece of art is now honoring the late Padres owner, Peter Seidler. The mural is on a wall outside of the Stone Brewing Tap Room on Kettner Boulevard. It was painted by an artist with ground floor murals just hours after Seidler's death was announced. Seidler died Tuesday at just 63 years old, leaving behind a wife and two daughters. Ground floor murals work can be found all over San Diego, actually featuring several of our local Padres players. And now Padres pitcher Blake Snell is a two time Cy Young Award winner. Snell just finished his best season with the Padres with the lowest ERA for starters in Major League Baseball and the second most strikeouts in the National League. The last Padres pitcher to win a Cy Young was Jake Peavy. Snell is currently a free agent, but we want to keep him. Well, an East County truck driver is making national headlines. CNN is airing his cell phone video of migrants crossing the border on his property near Hakumba. CBS 8's David Godfordson talked with Brian Silvas about what he's seeing along our southern border. I do not condone this. Working as a truck driver in Lakeside and living near the border in Hakumba, Brian Silvas says he never expected to make national news. Where are you from? Honduras? Until a CNN reporter showed up at his door doing a story on immigration. CNN came out there and they talked to me and wanted to interview me. So I said, sure, yeah, come on. You, they come, stayed on the property and looked at, you know, seen where they're coming through and everything. Silva's interview and border video are now posted on the CNN website. This country is about immigration and, and people coming here. My family immigrated here 14 generations ago. Silvis is glad his video is bringing awareness to the border situation near Hakumba. The border wall ends on his property, and that's where he says he's seen hundreds of migrants cross through a barbed wire fence since Title 42 expired in May. It's never been like this. I've been here 51 years. It's never been like this, never, ever in my life. He says he's called the Border Patrol, but since it's private property, agents told him they can't do anything about it. I was told this from the Border Patrol and the Sheriff, that we cannot stop them. So if they can't stop them and we can't stop them, then where are we at? If you want to see more of the interview with Silvis, We've posted a link at CBS8.com. David Godfordson, CBS8. David, we appreciate it. Well, meantime, the city of San Diego is not moving forward with Mayor Todd Gloria's housing 2.0 plan. The city council meeting lasted for six hours and had more than 85 speakers, a lot of interest. The proposal included more flexibility for public agencies to develop homes on publicly, publicly owned property and for more homes to be built on commercial sites like strip malls. It also would have relaxed parking requirements, especially near public transit, and it would have encouraged the creation of more single room occupancy homes for those at risk of falling into homelessness. There's students and youth who are living in walk-in closets in order to afford to live here in San Diego. They're living on the streets, they're couch surfing. Yeah, critics said it could come with issues and create income-based segregation in low-income areas. That's because one of the proposals would have allowed developers to build market rate and affordable income-based housing on different properties instead of in that same building. Well, an alert for consumers prepare to pay more for your utilities on December 1st, less than three weeks from now, San Diego water will cost you 5% more. It's the first step in several rate increases over the next two years. In total, San Diegans will be paying almost 20% more for water by 2025. For the average single family homeowner, that's about $12 more per month. The San Diego City Council approved the increases back in September really an issue that sparked a lot of anger and frustration. Right now, I live in a two-bedroom apartment with seven people. Three of us are working, and there's, we cannot still pay for utilities and food. So $12 make a big difference. Wastewater rates will also be going up in the new year. For more details on that and the future water rate increases, we have a lot more on CBS8.com. 
Well, for the first time since criminal charges were filed against Chula Vista City Council member Andrea Cardenas, the council held a meeting. And while Cardenas failed to show up, a number of her critics did, demanding her immediate resignation. CBS 8's Richard Allen tells us what they had to say and how Cardenas is also responding. Welcome, everybody. At the first Chula Vista City Council meeting since criminal charges were filed against Council Member Andrea Cardenas. Council Member Cardenas is absent. Cardenas was a no show, although she and her attorney have made it clear that she intends to hold on to her council seat despite her legal challenges. She does not plan to step down, she pl plans on fighting these charges. Last week, Andrea Cardenas and her brother Jesus pleaded not guilty in court to a number of charges, ranging from conspiracy to commit fraud to money laundering laundering to failing to file tax returns. Investigators say the siblings lied on their application to the federal government's Paycheck Protection Program to get $176,000 in taxpayer funds during the pandemic and then illegally used part of that money to help pay off Andrea Cardenas's campaign debt. She has taken our money and served it to pay her bills. And that's unacceptable. At Tuesday night's council meeting, speaker after speaker demanded Cardenas's resignation from both the Chula Vista City Council and her board membership and on like Sandbag. Said, and I'm sorry she's not here to hear us, but I hope she is listening to what we have to say here today, that we want her resignation as soon as possible. She stole our tax money. She stole it and lied that she had 34 employees and that money came from the government to our taxes. We don't trust her anymore. And while one speaker came to her defense. This is the United States of America and we have a presumption of innocence until we're convicted in a court of law. Others urged swift action by Mayor John McCann and the other council members. You guys need to censor her. You need to suspend her because we don't trust her anymore. She's a crook. Andrea Cardenas in a statement said she looks forward to being able to defend herself, adding, quote, my intent has never been to harm or disappoint those who believed in me, both in life and at the ballot box. She and her brother Jesus are scheduled to be back in court on January 3rd. Richard Allen, CBS 8. Richard, thank you. Well, the site of six old vacant homes in North Park is now covered with piles of debris. Demolition of the property on Bancroft Street is now underway as part of a plan to renovate the church building next door. The 35 square foot property is owned by the Makers Church. They're in the process of selling it to help renovate their 100 year old church campus. Meantime, neighbors say they are concerned about parking becoming more difficult. But the Makers Church says, quote, as part of the sale agreement, church leadership has required that the future project incorporates a significant amount of on-site parking, end quote. Well, smart streetlights and automated license plate readers will soon be installed across the city of San Diego. San Diego police got the final approval from the city council on Wednesday. 500 cameras will be installed at busy intersections, including the beach areas and downtown. Critics say they are concerned about the data being collected, but city leaders say that they will keep that data safe while the technology will help with investigations. This is not a proactive tool, this is a reactive tool. These are not being monitored 17, 724. This is a reactive tool after a very violent crime exists. Yeah, so San Diego police hope to have the smart streetlights and automated license plate readers running by January of 2024, pretty soon. We do have a map of the camera's proposed locations right there on CBS8.com. And plans to change a major thoroughfare in Little Italy are not moving forward. The Downtown Community Planning Council rejected a proposal that would have removed parking along Grape Street to increase traffic lanes. Grape Street is used by people traveling from the airport typically to get to the five. The Planning Council said adding a fourth lane would decrease travel time by 28.6 seconds. I don't think 28.6 seconds is worth more collisions with pedestrians. I don't think it's worth uh, significantly worse quality of life for Little Italy residents. Yeah, if the city chooses, it can submit a revision to the Grape Street proposal or a completely different plan to alleviate traffic to and from the airport. 
Well, the city of San Diego says it's launching the safe sidewalk program to make it easier for people to make sidewalk repairs on private property. The program waives permit fees and expedites the repair process. It's designed to help homeowners make those repairs and save money. The city says many homeowners are unaware that the state law makes them the response that state law, excuse me, makes them responsible for maintaining sidewalks in front of private property. You can head to our website, cbs8.com, for more information on the safe sidewalk program and who's responsible. Well, we are hearing now from the superintendent at Poway Unified, who's being accused of bullying student athletes. Parents showed up at a board meeting on Thursday, but the board held a closed session right before coming back with how they will move forward. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen was there. Accused of abusing her position. I spoke to the Poway superintendent this afternoon. She says she did nothing wrong, but the parents I spoke with disagree. I am the superintendent's daughter, but I'm also a student in this district who deserves kindness and also has a right to feel safe. So please stop all this craziness so that our senior year can be everything that we'd hoped it would be. That's Jessica Phelps, the daughter of Poway Unified School District Superintendent Marion Kim Phelps, who was in the hot seat over an alleged incident that happened five months ago. Del Norte High School softball teammates say Superintendent Phelps threatened their graduation privileges since they did not clap loud enough for her daughter during the softball awards banquet. She made life hell for 10 seniors threatening to bar them from their own graduation if they didn't admit that they did something they didn't do. I spoke with Superintendent Phelps this afternoon about the allegations against her. It had nothing to do with the clapping or whether or not anybody received um, claps. At today's school board meeting, Phelps' daughter claimed she herself was the victim of bullying within the Del Norte High School softball program. I want the truth to be heard. I love my school and I'm proud to be a Nighthawk. And this was never about getting enough applause at a softball banquet, rather. This is about having to endure being bullied, being yelled at in front of my teammates, and being publicly humiliated. In a board meeting last week, parents say Phelps also made inappropriate social media posts and contacted students late at night. I've never threatened any student. I never would. I've never talked to any student about uh, making threats about them not graduating. Um, all of those accusations are completely false and fabricated. Today, parents are urging the school board to take action against the superintendent. There was an abuse of power. It was inappropriate. Well, I think a number of students have been impacted, but one in particular who's now a senior uh, was forced to sign an anti-bully, anti-hazing contract in order to be able to participate in any activities at the school outside of the classroom. And uh, no other students were asked to sign that. Parent Judy Simaroth started this petition with more than 600 signatures, urging president of the school board, Dr. Patel, to immediately terminate the superintendent. Dr. Patel, you are not qualified to be a leader. You are negligent in the protection of children, our children. After a nearly two and a half hour closed session, the board announced there will be an independent investigation of the Del Norte softball program before any further steps are taken. The board has not ignored this matter, but is bound by privacy laws that do not allow us to make public statements regarding specific student or employee matters. For more on this story, head to CBS8.com. Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. Ariana, thanks. And yes, the superintendent did send out an email to all district staff saying that she once again, it says that the allegations made against her are untrue. The board released a statement saying in part, quote, our priority in classrooms and in school curricular extra extracurricular activities is to provide an environment where all students can have a positive experience, end quote. Well, the Coronado Fire Department says it's working to improve the city's outdated emergency alert system. They tested out new technology this week. You may have heard that the siren sound around 9 on Tuesday morning. Well, the new siren technology can also relay information about an event, an evacuation order, and more. People we talked with who heard the siren say that they're in favor of really whatever it takes to keep the community safe. For the community to be alert, there's so many things going around that we always have to be prepared. So I think it's a great attribute to 
what is already in place. This is only yeah, no word yet on how much this technology may cost or when a new system will be in place. Well, hundreds of thousands of dollars will be used to crack down on human trafficking operations right here in San Diego. Wednesday, local and state leaders announced $600,000 in state funding. The FBI has identified San Diego as one of the country's hot spots for human trafficking, ranking 13th in the nation with as many as 8,000 victims locally each and every year. It's getting worse, actually, and that's that's why it's so important to have this additional funding to help us combat this so we can work jointly uh, with the department, you know, with other agencies throughout the city. Officials say the funding will help conduct investigations and will help police track down offenders who prey on vulnerable men, women and children. Well, we now have answers as to what most likely caused the crash of a twin engine Cessna right into a Santee neighborhood in October of 2021. The crash killed the pilot as well as a UPS driver on the ground. More than two years later, the NTSB just released its final investigative report. It determines that the probable cause of the accident was loss of control by the pilot due to spatial disorientation. As the pilot was flying through clouds and apparently attempting to come in for a landing there at Montgomery Field. So spatial disorientation is a fancy way of describing vertigo. Vertigo is what happens when there's a conflict in the brain between what the eyes see and what the body feels. Yeah, to take a look at the final report issued by the NTSB for yourself, just go to CBS8.com, click on the online version of this story. Well, right now, investigators are looking into what led to a fatal crash in Otay Mesa West. A driver smashed into a Cricket wireless store early Monday morning and was killed in that crash. It happened at the corner of Coronado Avenue and 30th Street just after 4. Police found the car lodged in the back of the concrete building. The driver pronounced dead at the scene. The Cricket store is now closed until they can fix that wall. I honestly don't know how I'm standing here or how am I still breathing without her. Yeah, you are listening to a grieving mother who lost her child in a tragic accident during a vacation stay at an Airbnb. Monday, she and her husband sued Airbnb for the wrongful death of their child. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen spoke with those parents. Yes, I spoke with the San Ysidro mother and father who shared their heart-wrenching experience of how they lost their two-year-old daughter. Today, they announced they are suing Airbnb and they hope this never happens to another child. I just wish this didn't happen to us. I just wish it didn't exist to anybody. This San Ysidro family went on a vacation to create memories and instead went through a nightmare. She was my rainbow baby. Back in November 2021, Esmer Esmeralda Garcia and her husband, Ricardo Collin, planned a Puerta Vallarta trip with their two-year-old daughter, Grecia, and other family members. They booked this family villa through the Airbnb app. Within only 20 minutes of arriving to the villa, their attorney says little Grecia was found floating in the swimming pool. Little Grecia walks up the steps, we suppose, because nobody saw her, and ends up in the pool. She was airlifted to Rady Children's Hospital, where she later died. Esmeralda was pregnant at the time. I was buried my daughter. It gave birth to my other baby. The family is emphasizing in their lawsuit, Airbnb had no safety measures in place to prevent children access to the pool. They say they trusted the Airbnb app's recommendations after indicating their family had eight guests, including a two-year-old child. What they could have done is they could have had a tarp on top of the pool. So this little girl would not fall inside the pool. They did nothing because they didn't care. A spokesperson with Airbnb told CBS 8 in part, quote, our hearts go out to the Garcia Collin family for their tragic loss. As of now, we have not been served with this lawsuit. Photos of the pool were visible on the listing page. We had not previously received reports of issues with the property, which is no longer active on the platform. Meanwhile, Esmeralda keeps a piece of her daughter's memory close to her heart every day and still carries Gracia's pacifier 
everywhere she goes. I don't want this to be a circus because it's not. You're talking to somebody that's a human being and this pain hurts. And you're talking about my daughter here and nothing's going to bring her back. Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. <laughs> And her there just smelling those flowers so sweet. Our hearts go out to you sincerely. Well, we are now hearing from a woman who witnessed the second smash and grab shoplifting incident at Fashion Valley Mall in two weeks. Cindy Henrique was at the Nordstrom Cafe at Fashion Valley Mall earlier this month when she saw five people wearing black face masks walk into this Chanel boutique right inside Nordstrom. She says they took handfuls of purses. You don't know if they're going to come out, people chasing them, they have weapons or whatever. It was just a couple minutes later, they all came running out. Uh, one of them actually dropped a purse, but they all had their hands full of purses, and then they went running towards a getaway car. Yeah, she claims police didn't show up for hours. San Diego police did tell us that there were two smash and grabs at this same Chanel store on November 3rd, and then also the 8th. They are certainly working to locate witnesses. Well, consumer experts are warning to steer clear of the Chinese owned retailer Timu website, which is known for its shockingly low prices. It's flooded with thousands of consumer complaints, though, ranging from poor quality items to overcharging your credit card. Security experts also warn against clicking on unknown links during this holiday season. Abby Black is working for you on how to protect your wallet. The National Retail Federation estimates a record holiday spending this year and scammers are banking on it. What makes these schemes different than in years past? They're more sophisticated and they look and sound so real. But we're working for you and spoke to a security expert so you don't get duped. Shoppers trying to save this holiday could end up losing more in phishing, smishing and vishing scams. We're working for you to explain these holiday schemes. What is phishing? It's when scammers use email to dupe you. GuidePoint Security Senior Expert Christopher Warner says the popular phishing scam this time of year is getting an email from your grocer about a free turkey. Look at the email because things could be spelled different, spelled wrong. I found a red flag in this free turkey email pretending to be from Whole Foods. Instead, it's spelled Holes Foods. What is smishing? It starts by sending text messages with a link for you to click on. The text messages are conversational and friendly or it's about a so-called Amazon delivery. Warner says don't engage and delete. Even if you don't open it, there could be a risk. So if you don't know who it's from, it's best like on the Apple, you can just swipe it and say, you know, report junk, don't open it. Finally, what is vishing? These scams are played out by phone or through voicemail. This is one that can be really scary because generative AI is advancing faster than most experts can comprehend. These are phone calls from people sounding like the voice of someone you know. Hey, this is Carter. I need your credit card number right now. I mean, that really sounded like me. But it's fake. Experts say that you should have a code word with the people you know, and if you answer the phone, don't say much. They'll ask you certain things, and it puts enough information to basically pronounce every word. Security experts say the best way to protect yourself against these cyber scams, validate their legitimacy, check with the source, don't click on the links, and contact your bank or credit card company to freeze your account if you think or know that you've been duped and trust your gut. If it sounds too good to be true, it's probably good. too good to be true. Working for you, Abby Black, CBS 8. Yes, yeah, somehow, some way, always good advice, Abby. Thanks. Well, here's a scary scene playing out at La Jolla Cove where a crowd gathered around sea lions once again and then took off running when the mammals aggressively moved toward them. CBS 8 Steve Price spoke to the woman who shot that video and to a marine mammal expert about the dangers of getting so close to these sea lions. Caught on camera over the weekend, video of people crowding around the sea lions here in La Jolla Cove, getting within just a few feet of the protected mammals. Then chaos as the sea lions try to protect themselves and their turf. Yeah, back yeah. up! The crowd scatters as the male sea lions move toward them. This video was shot by Amber Hand, who says just moments earlier, she warned people to move back. They were getting closer and closer, and at some points, people were reaching their hand out to touch the sea lions. 
She also sent us this video of a child mimicking a sea lion before it clearly got annoyed. If you're changing the animal's behavior, so even if it looks at you, then that definitely means that you are too close to the animals. Jenny Smith is a supervisor with SeaWorld's Rescue Department. She says wild animals can be very unpredictable and you should stay at least 50 feet away. Just try to think of like a school bus. Hey, stupid, back up! Stay as far away from the sea lions as at least a school bus is linked. Sea lions are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act but NOAA is in charge of enforcing that, not lifeguards, and NOAA doesn't keep the area regularly staffed. There are signs posted, but they're easy to miss, and as we saw today, they aren't working. We captured several people within inches of the animals. There's lots of sea lions down there. They are very social, gregarious animals. They're really fun to watch, um, but should definitely watch them from a distance. It's dangerous to be right there. Jenny says sea lions don't generally attack people, but if they feel threatened, they can bite, move faster than you'd think, and weigh hundreds of pounds. Both Jenny and Amber agree it's an awesome treat to have this opportunity to see these amazing creatures in their natural environment. Yeah, go sea lions! Just remember to keep your distance. I just hope that people respect them and yeah, just give them their space. At La Jolla Cove, Steve Price, CBS 8. Yeah, they're so incredible. So we got to just respect them so we can continue to coexist. All right, well, the San Diego Humane Society is waiving all adoption fees for more than 400 dogs and puppies, but they've actually paused owner surrender services unless it's an emergency. That's because they are dealing with a highly contagious illness right now. So far, three dogs have actually died from a respiratory disease called strep zoo, and 77 others were exposed. The Humane society says dogs usually catch it from being in a shelter or kennel with other dogs. This has happened because we have been operating beyond our capacity for so long and so we really need the community's help to get these dogs out of our care and into loving homes. The Humane Society says it's very rare for the disease to spread to humans or cats. They say they need help with adopting or fostering at least 100 dogs right now. Well, a famous animal sculptor says that she needs your help to create a statue of Ricochet. Of course, the surf dog right there on Del Mar's dog beach. Now, before Ricochet's owner, Judy Fredono died, she did ask Susan Bahari to create a statue of Ricochet when he passed away last spring. Bahari created the nation's first official war dog memorial in 1994. She also memorialized Sully, the service dog of President George H.W. Bush. Bahari hopes to raise $145,000. So head to CBS8.com for more information. Meantime, right now, the search is on for San Diego State's next head football coach. With just two games left of the regular season, head coach Brady Hoke announced Monday he is retiring at the end of the season. Hoke spent six seasons as head coach of the team with an overall 39 and 31 record. Hoke says he's, quote, proud of what we accomplished at San Diego State. And this season, the Aztecs have been unable to gain traction. And right now, the team is last in the Mountain West Conference. Still love you, though. I'm a proud Aztec. It's also been hard for the team to fill up the stands at Snapdragon Stadium. CBS 8 Steve Price spoke with some fans who shared their frustration and with a longtime local sports insider who talked about the search for that new coach. With a new stadium came new hope for San Diego State football. A smaller facility would mean more sellouts, a louder environment, a true home field advantage. But now, less than two seasons into Snapdragon Stadium, we're already seeing crowds smaller than what we saw in the old stadium in its last year. Now that Brady Hoke is leaving, can a new coach turn things around? Touchdown, Colorado State! Even if San Diego State's football team wins its last two games, It'll finish with a losing record, the school's first since 2009, and a huge drop from just two years ago when the team won 12 games. It's upsetting, like going to the games and like having like wanting to have fun and stuff, and seeing 
I don't know, just not good football, if you want to put it that way. A lot of students and alumni seem to feel that way. Attendance is way down. Four of the last six home games have had less than 25,000 fans. Last season, they never broke below that barrier, so fans say something has to change. And Coach Hoax retiring may be that something they need. I'm not really sure what's going on in the dressing room, but I think something needs to change. I think it could start with the coach. With so many colleges switching conferences right now, the timing for San Diego State to be a cellar dweller in football couldn't be worse. I think this is the biggest hire San Diego State's ever made in football. Coach John Quintero, who grew up around San Diego sports and hosts a popular talk show, thinks the team should go after an offensive-minded coach, but he also believes fans have to be realistic. The school is probably going to end up with a young up-and-coming assistant who has little to no head coaching experience. And if they do well, they probably won't be here long. This is really kind of a stepping, tone, stepping stone job uh, in the Mountain West Conference right now. You see guys all the time in the Mountain West Conference, their next job is in a Power Five Conference. Of course, that could change if the Aztecs move to a Power Five Conference in the near future. And if you put a good product on the field, the fans will show up. Just look at State's basketball team. Viejas definitely gets bumping for sure. I remember going to the watch party for the final for the finals game, and that was one of the best sports moments of my life. Hope will finish out the season as the team's coach. A new hire should be announced sometime in December. Steve Price, CBS 8. Yeah, I'll root for them no matter what. Steve, thank you. A win is a whole lot better, though. Well, a South Bay school district unanimously passed a resolution to go all electric, but it wasn't their idea. Instead, it was a group of students who led the way. CBS 8's Steve Price has more on the changes, the impact they'll have on students and the environment. Students in the Sweetwater Union School District are charged up over a plan to make their campuses more environmentally friendly by switching from fossil fuels to clean energy. And the district has now agreed to make the move. Their buses run on liquid fuels and buildings are powered by natural gas. Students learning about saving the environment while surrounded by things destroying it. We're being taught, hey, climate change is bad but yet we're contributing to the palm. So student leaders at campuses across the Sweetwater Union School District decided to take action. This is what community looks like. They came up with a plan to leave their schools more environmentally friendly than when they arrived, including converting their entire bus fleet from gas to electric, adding electric vehicle charging stations on campus, and getting the board to agree that all new construction will be built without gas infrastructure. I'm excited to see action. I'm excited to see electric buses, electric bus chargers, like EV chargers at all of our schools. Uh, I think it's really cool. The district already has solar panels on 21 campuses, and state and federal grants will help pay for the future upgrades. District leaders applaud the students for coming up with this plan and working with them to make it a reality. Our role here in education is generating the next generation of leaders. And what a better way to do that than to demonstrate to them that they're voice matters, their advocacy matters. The students had help from a local organization called Climate Action Campaign, which says these changes will have a wide-reaching positive influence. And this can impact things like asthma rates, learning outcomes, absenteeism levels. So it's really important that we have schools that are healthy and sustainable. Climate Action Campaign will serve as a watchdog to make sure agreed upon changes are actually implemented, but they know the students will also help hold the district accountable. They're really what make me hopeful for the future. And for students, this is just the start of their activism. Isaiah says next on his agenda is voter registration. In Chula Vista, Steve Price, CBS 8. Well, protecting and maintaining the health of our water quality is vital in San Diego. Clean water, clean water is good for the health of our ecosystem and, of course, for us. CBS 8's chief meteorologist, Carlene Chavis, shows us how to keep water from trickling off your property and how to save that water in the process. Irrigation runoff is a major contributor to water contamination in our county. Remember, the water on your property doesn't always stay there. That's why Project Clean Water wants you to keep runoff in check. 
We want to make sure that when we're irrigating all of these beautiful lawns that we have, that the water we are using stays on those lawns, yes. isn't hitting things like cement and then running off, and making sure that we're being really efficient with the use of that water. Excess water usage from sprinklers allows water to run off your property and transports toxins like oil from streets and driveways, harmful chemicals from fertilizers, and even trash. These untreated pollutants end up in our creeks, rivers, lakes, and eventually the ocean. Chelsea McGimsey with Project Clean Waters like says we should grass, use these practices year round, but right now would be a good time to make adjustments before we get into our rainier months. So when we get rains and they're flushing things out, there's not as much of a buildup on like our roads or things of the different pollutants just because it's getting flushed out by the rain. But in the dry season when we're not getting rain, the only thing that's going to be flushing all of those pollutants is water running off of your property, which means there's going to be a higher concentration of it in that runoff, and it's going to be a higher dose into our waterways. The Keep the Runoff in Check campaign focuses on three key actions. One, inspect your irrigation for leaks and misaligned sprinklers. Two, direct your watering. Make sure you are targeting plants, not the sidewalk or streets, and please avoid overwatering. Three, protect waterways from pollution by stopping the runoff from leaving your property. This For helpful really tips, we met up at the Water Conservation Garden in El Cajon, and I must say, I was digging these tiki sprinklers. So it's, a, it's in its mouth? It is, oh, okay. and if you press it, it'll, you know, you get over there, that's one type, or you can oh. get these guys. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and you see how they've got it so that it's only landing on soil. Yes. We're not landing on pavement here. No. And it's very slightly sloped into this runoff basin here, which then you can use this to store, you can water your plants through that instead of having to use your metered water that you have to pay for. So this is a really interesting feature. Actually. Chelsea showed well, off this feature, a bioretention basin. So you can look at your own property and see where water is running on it naturally and you can create this type of detention basin. It turns into a beautiful nice little pond during the rain. It catches all your over irrigation when you're just watering your lawn in the summers. But wait, there's more, especially if you're down to get your hands dirty. Composting isn't just a great natural fertilizer. When you layer it on top of your lawn or your landscaping, mm -hmm. it creates a protective barrier that holds moisture against the ground, doesn't allow it to run off, mm -hmm. and allows all of that moisture to slowly percolate down into your landscaping while providing nutrients for all of your plants to grow and look very lush. The use of mulch is also a great way to keep runoff on your property because the woody light material is efficient in absorbing water. Chelsea recommends putting two to three inches on your grass. Your soil will only absorb so much before it can't absorb anymore. Yes. We call that soil saturation. Okay. And once it hits that point, your grass can't suck it up as fast. You know, it can't drink fast enough to keep up. And so all that water is going to run off your property. And in the long run, these tips to help you keep runoff in check will protect our county's ecosystem and prevent money from draining out of your checking account. So if you're making sure that your sprinklers are aligned properly, that you have no water running off of your property, and that it's all getting held in, you know, with like your mulch or your landscaping, you're really making use of less water because it's kept right where it needs to be. And so you can keep your water bill down and hopefully mitigate some of those increased water costs. Saving our environment and money? Count me in. For CBS 8, I'm Chief Meteorologist Carlene Chavis. Truly so, so important, Carlene, thank you. As always, thank you for your time as well. Thanks for staying informed. For CBS 8, I'm Jenny Day. Take such good care.